here's a clipping I cut out of the Fresno Bee newspaper. It was some time back. The headline reads, Church May Drop Onward Christian Soldiers. Let me read you some parts out of this article. A committee from the United Methodist Church voted to delete Onward Christian Soldiers and most of the Battle Hymn of the Republic from their hymnals because those hymns are too militaristic. We live in a world of war, said Ezra Earl Jones, a member of the Hymnal Revision Committee from Nashville. <clears throat> the church has an opportunity to offer an alternative to war. Another committee member, Mary Brooke Kassad from Gainesville, Georgia, commented, I'm trying to raise my sons to be peacemakers, not soldiers. Well, have those committee members forgotten that Christians are involved in a spiritual warfare? Well, in case they have forgotten, you and I have not forgotten. And today in my series on tearing down spiritual strongholds, we're going to look at one verse, Ephesians 6.13. This verse teaches us three big lessons about our spiritual warfare with Satan and his demons. Here's lesson number one. Your job is to stand your ground. In our key text, we read, Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Notice that the word stand occurs twice in that verse. It's also found two verses earlier in verse 11 which says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And then in verse 14, the word stand occurs a fourth time. Stand firm then. So when God says something one time, it's important. But here God tells us four times to stand to stand our ground in spiritual warfare. So we better not miss this. This word stand implies that our job in spiritual warfare is to stand firm and not lose the ground that Jesus has won for us. There is no new territory that we need to win because God has already blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ, as Ephesians 1, 3 says earlier in this same book. So <clears throat> in the verse we're focusing on today, Ephesians 6, 13, God tells us, stand your ground. Mark that word, your. This is your ground. You don't have to march into Satan's territory and take it from him because he has no territory that rightfully belongs to him. There is no command in this passage to march, but four commands to stand. So again, in our verse for today, Ephesians 6, 13, the command is, stand your ground. These words carry the idea of holding your ground. So we don't need to invade enemy territory. Instead, of stand your ground, the New American Standard Bible translates it, resist. When you resist something, you try to stop it from happening. The Good News Bible renders Ephesians 6.13, resist the enemy's attacks. Again, this pictures us on the defensive, not the offensive. We don't have to snatch anything away from Satan. Instead, he's trying to snatch something away from us, namely the blessings Jesus has already given us. Now, <clears throat> during Jesus' earthly life, his spiritual warfare with Satan was offensive. He waged war against Satan to gain what we had lost back in the Garden of Eden. There, Satan robbed Adam and Eve of their innocence, their fellowship with God, 
their joy, their peace with God, and the kind of life God intended for them. Because Adam and Eve were our representatives in the Garden of Eden, the entire human race sank into sin and death with them. The devil covered us with guilt and shame. But then Jesus came to earth to win back for us everything we had lost in Adam. The final stroke of Jesus' victory took place when he died on the cross. According to Colossians 2.15, it says, And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Listen to that same verse in the New Century Version. God stripped the spiritual rulers and powers of their authority. With the cross, he won the victory and showed the world that they were powerless. Because Jesus has stripped the demons of their authority, they have no authority over you. And because Jesus showed the world that the demons were powerless, they have no power over you, no right to control you. The end of our main verse for the day says, and after you have done everything to stand. Where does God want you to stand? I can think of two places. Number one, stand in Christ. Jesus is like a champion boxer who has knocked out his opponent. The opponent is now unconscious on the mat and Jesus is standing tall with his arms raised in the ring. And because you and I are in Christ, we share in this victory. We don't have to knock out the devil because Jesus has already knocked him out. When the devil wakes up and starts punching us, our job is to stand firm by trusting in the finished work of Christ for us on the cross. Here's the second place you can stand. <clears throat> stand on God's word. Jesus stood on God's word in the fourth chapter of Matthew when for 40 days he was tempted by the devil in the wilderness. The Bible records three of those specific temptations and in each one of the three, Jesus fought it off by declaring, it is written. And then he quoted a verse out of the scriptures, the, the Old Testament. That is how you stand on the word of God. <clears throat> a young man was leaving home for college, just a freshman leaving home for the first time. His dad gave him a Bible and he said, and son, here is a list of verses on this paper. When you have a certain need, look on this paper, you'll find the need, and then you'll see the, the Bible verse you're supposed to look up to meet that need. So the son took the Bible and the list of Bible verses and went off to college, put them on a shelf, never did open, never did lift his Bible at all, and came home uh, complaining about a lack of funds. The father said, son, can I uh, see that Bible that I gave you before you left? The boy handed it over, and the father says, yeah, and here's this list of Bible verses to meet various needs that you would have, and I just want to show you now that on the page in the Bible of each of these Bible verses on this paper, on that same page as the Bible verse, I tucked in some money for you. Now see, that illustrates how we need to stand on the word of God, not just by having a Bible on the shelf, no, no, but by, you know, taking our Bible and opening it and, and reading our, our Bible. And as we do that, finding its promises and then claiming its promises. Like we sang this morning, standing on, standing on the promises. <clears throat> so, now, uh, just before the people of Israel moved into the promised land, 
God told their leader, Joshua, I will give you every place where you set your foot. Before they could receive God's blessings in the promised land, they had to pace off the land and claim it as their own. Now for you and me today, our promised land is right here in my hand. It's the Bible. And God, the promised land stretches from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And God wants us to step off the land by opening our Bibles, reading through it, finding the promises, <clears throat> and, and claiming it. This is our promised, uh, promised land. So we don't have to worry about occupying ground that is already ours. We don't fight for victory, we fight from victory. Now, in the Old Testament book of Joshua, God's people went into the promised land and fought battles with the pagans who lived in that land. The Jews were fighting not to gain new territory, but to claim the inheritance that God had already given them. Satan's goal then is to move you off the ground of victory that Jesus has already given you. You don't have to ask God to help you win the victory over Satan. And you don't have to ask God to win, to defeat the devil through you. Instead, you can simply thank God that Christ has already defeated the enemy and you can claim the promises God has made to you in Scripture. Now here's the second thing I find in Ephesians 6.13. To stand your ground, you must put on the full armor of God. Bible commentator David Fettes writes, If you were fighting a battle, would you want, what would you want to wear? With artillery firing and shrapnel flying, would you rather be wearing a baseball cap or a heavy-duty helmet? If an enemy was using poison gas against you, would you rather be wearing designer glasses or a gas mask? If a sniper was aiming bullets at your heart, would you rather be wearing a light t-shirt or body armor? If you were advancing against an enemy position, would you rather be wearing, would you rather be riding a golf cart or an armor-plated tank? If you were in a war, you would want the best protection you could get. Well, the answers to David Fettis' questions are obvious, aren't they? And that takes us straight back to our key verse, which begins by saying, therefore, put on the full armor of God. Notice how this talks about the full armor of God. It's important that we wear <clears throat> all of the armor that God has given us and not just some of it. If we neglect to put on one piece of the armor, Satan will attack us there. Now here's a story out of Greek mythology. When Achilles was a little baby, uh, it was predicted that he would die at a very young age. Well, his mother, Thetis, didn't like to hear that. <clears throat> and she knew of a river called Styx that would give powers of invulnerability to anyone who dipped in it. So she took her little son, Achilles, to the river Styx, and she grabbed him by the heel. Here's a painting that depicts the whole thing. She held him upside down, and she dipped him in the river. But because she was holding her son, Achilles, by the heel, the heel didn't go under water. Well, Achilles grew up, and he became the greatest hero, uh, Greek hero in the uh, Trojan War. In Achilles' story, the Iliad, Achilles, uh, in uh, Homer's story, the Iliad, Achilles is the hero of the story. But a man on the other, in, in the other side of the war named Paris shoots an arrow at random, and it hits Achilles in the heel. Remember, that's the one place that the magical river Styx did not touch, and Achilles died very quickly. 
Now, I'm sure you've all heard of, you know, the, the term, the, his Achilles heel. When you say somebody has an Achilles heel, we mean that's their one area of weakness. That's their vulnerable spot. And you might think that you don't need a certain piece of the full armor of God, but that's like telling God, I depend on you in certain areas of my life, but not in every area. I can handle some things in my life without your help, but that's a proud and dangerous thing to say. Gordon MacDonald is a famous American pastor. He wrote Christian books and articles in Christian magazines, and I would say that 30 years ago, just about every pastor in America knew who Gordon MacDonald was. And then <clears throat> we were shocked when the news came out that Gordon MacDonald had been carrying on an adulterous affair. He was repentant and submissive to his church's discipline and so was restored to leadership uh, some years later. After his restoration, he went on to become the president of Denver Seminary and the editor-in-chief of Leadership Journal. In his humble testimony, Gordon MacDonald said, these are his, his words, before I fell into the sin of adultery, my attitude was, if the devil ever trips me up, I know that it won't be in the area of my marriage because my marriage is very strong. But in a few years, Pastor MacDonald had committed adultery and lost his ministry. His marriage was the one area of life over which he neglected to wear the armor of God. Scripture warns us, 1 Corinthians 10:12. If you think you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. Jesus predicted that Peter would disown him three times, and Peter made an oath in Matthew 26, 33, even if all fall away on, you account, fall away on account of you, I never will. But before that night was over, Peter had disowned Jesus three times. Standing our ground then means begins with putting on the armor of God. Notice that the pieces of God's armor are mostly defensive. Things like a breastplate, a shield, and a helmet. There is one offensive weapon, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, but even that weapon can be used for defense as well as for offense. So. The point again is that God doesn't expect you to invade foreign territory. So back to our key verse, Ephesians 6.13, therefore put on the full armor of God. Now, how likely are you to leave home in the morning without any clothes on? Well, I know that's ridiculous, that's far-fetched, preposterous, uh, but many Christians walk out of their homes every morning without their spiritual clothing on, and that is very dangerous. You have to put on the full armor of God. You have to have it on all the time. There is no time that you can let down your guard because there is no time that the enemy stops his assault. The moment you think you're safe is the most dangerous moment of your life. God gives you each piece of armor for a specific reason. Now, in future studies, we're going to examine the individual pieces of armor one at a time. But for now, understand that to stand your ground against Satan in spiritual warfare, you have to dress yourself in the full armor of God, and you cannot neglect one piece. And then here's my third point this morning. <clears throat> to stand your ground, you must prepare yourself for the day of evil. Our key verse for the day goes on to say, Ephesians 6, 13, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. 
It doesn't say if the day of evil comes, but when it comes. Again, we see ourselves here in a defensive position. The day of evil comes upon us. We don't attack it. The word when implies this day of evil can catch us by surprise because we don't know when it will come. And that's why we must always be dressed in God's armor and ready to fight. A pivotal battle in the American Revolutionary War (coughs) was the Battle of Trenton. It took place on the morning of December 26, 1776, in Trenton, New Jersey. George Washington was commander-in-chief of the Continental Army. On the previous night, which was Christmas night, Washington had led the main body of the Continental Army across the Delaware River. Because the river was icy and the weather severe, the crossing proved dangerous. Then the army marched nine miles through icy and snowy terrain to the city of Trenton. Hessian Hessian soldiers were gathered at Trenton. The Hessians were professional fighters from Germany that the British had hired to stamp out the pesky Americans. After a brief battle, near the entire Hessian force was captured with very small losses to the Americans. The battle significantly boosted the Continental's flagging morale and inspired re-enlistments. The Continental Army had previously suffered severe defeats in New York and been forced to retreat through New Jersey to Pennsylvania. Morale in the Army was low, So, to end the year on a positive note, George Washington decided, uh, devised this plan to cross the Delaware River on the night of December 25 and 26 and surround the Hessian garrison. The Hessians had lowered their guard, thinking they were safe from the American army. Thus, Washington's forces caught them off guard and defeated them. With the success of the American Revolution in doubt, just a week earlier, the army had seemed on the verge of collapse. The dramatic victory inspired soldiers to serve longer and attracted new recruits to the ranks. Some historians say the reason the Hessian soldiers were caught off guard was that they thought the Americans would take Christmas Day off. Uh, But a better explanation is that the weather was so bad and the trip so far, nine miles through ice and snow, all of which the Americans would have to march, that the Hessians assumed the Americans would never attempt such a low percentage plan. Well, the lesson of the Battle of Trenton is that when you're in a war, you must always be ready for battle. Our key verse continues, when the day of evil comes. But it doesn't say when that day will be. You never know when you'll need to fight Satan, so be ready at all times. The phrase, the day of evil, is vague. And I want to try to clarify it for you So I'm going to give you now four specific examples of what Ephesians 6.13 calls the day of evil. Here's the first. The day of evil will come when you suffer a loss. You may lose your job, your health, your wealth, your reputation, or a family member in death. That's when Satan will whisper in your ear that you should become bitter against God. That's what Satan tried to do in the book of Job when Job lost all his wealth, all his health, and all ten of his children died in a tornado. But Job didn't give in to the tempter's suggestion. 
by trusting in his Lord, even when he couldn't understand why these things had happened to him, Job was still standing his ground when the day of evil came. Now, second, the day of evil will come when temptation overwhelms you. Maybe there are some temptations that you can handle pretty easily. Maybe if if something goes wrong and Satan tempts you to utter a curse word, you, you, you say, no, I'm not, I'm not going to say that. You know, I, I'm not going to curse. Good for you. you. You defeated the temptation. Or let's say you break something in the home that your marriage partner highly values, and the, Satan says to you, ah, oh, just, just blame it on the kids. Tell your partner that one of the kids must have broken it. But, but you resist that temptation. You say, no, that would be lying. I don't want to lie. And so you admit to your marriage partner that you broke this item, you apologize, and you offer to pay either for the damages or a replacement. Okay, good for you. But then there's your besetting sin that overwhelms you with temptation. Maybe it's a temptation to look at pornography on the internet and you have fallen into that sin. You've given into that temptation many times. Or maybe somebody who is not your spouse has verbalized it to you that he or she is ready, willing, and able to have an affair with you. <clears throat> well, and, and um, you, s- since then, you've been having fantasies about doing that. You feel a passion to hook up with this person, and it seems like this is your only path to happiness. But if you've consistently immersed your mind and heart in God's word, (coughs) and you're relying on the power of the Holy Spirit, you can resist even your besetting sin. The reason many Christians fall into sin when tempted is not really that the temptation is too strong, The real reason is they're spiritually unprepared. If you neglect the Bible when your life is full of blessings, it will be hard to find what you need in the Bible when the day of evil comes and Satan tempts you. Third, the day of evil will come when you hear false teaching. Someone you work with says, Oh, you know, I don't think I have to obey all those commands in the Bible because the Bible was written 2,000 and more years ago. It's just not relevant for today. You hear that and and you wonder, hmm, you know, that sounds like a pretty strong argument. Maybe I should believe the same thing. Or somebody else says to you, I can't believe in a God who would send people to eternal punishment in hell. That's just too strict. You hear this person say that and you say to yourself, you know, maybe I shouldn't believe in a God like that either. Or a pastor speaking to his congregation says, Jesus is not the one path of salvation. God is not that strict. God loves everybody And anybody who has faith in any God, even if it's not Jesus, he's going to welcome into heaven. As well as people with no faith in any God, but they're they're just trying their best to live a good life. God sees that. He's not going to judge them. They'll be okay. And you think to yourself, well, you know, that's not what I believe, but if a pastor says that, Maybe I should believe it. And so the day of evil is upon you. But when you hear the false teaching, you can be ready for spiritual battle by having fed yourself on Scripture every day. Now, fourth, the day of evil will come when persecution strikes you. You may assume that people you know and work with are friendly to Christians. But the time comes when they will mock you 
when you'll lose friends because you follow Christ, when you'll be intentionally overlooked for a job promotion because you're a Christian, or when you'll lose your job because you refuse to take part in dishonest business practices. Again, Satan will try to make you angry at God for these setbacks. But if you've fed yourself regularly on the meat of God's word, part of which says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, 2 Timothy 3.12. You'll be dressed in God's armor and ready to defeat that attack. The key here is to be ready in advance. Be ready for losses before they come. Be ready for temptation before it confronts you. Be ready for false teaching <coughs> Excuse me. before you hear it. Be ready for persecution before it strikes you. Put on the full armor of God before Satan attacks you. Look again at our key verse for today, Ephesians 6.13. So that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. Now, so I've been talking all morning here about stand your ground. Four times in the context from Ephesians 6.11 to 14, God commands us, stand your ground. And that's been my title of this message today. So I'm going to conclude the message by sharing with you our Lord's command out of the old hymn, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. So if, uh, yeah, written by uh, George Duffield. <clears throat> so if you're able to stand, I would like you please to stand now <clears throat> while I quote this to you. <clears throat> stand up. Stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner. It must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead till every foe is vanquished and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. The trumpet call obey. Forth to the mighty conflict in this his glorious day. Ye that are men, now serve him against unnumbered foes. <clears throat> Let courage rise with danger and strength to strength oppose. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you. Ye dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor. Each piece put on with prayer. Where duty calls or danger, be never wanting there. Stand up. Stand up for Jesus. The strife will not be long. This day the noise of battle, the next the victor's song. To him that overcometh, a crown of life shall be. He with the king of glory shall reign eternally. Thank you, Father, that you've fought all the battles for us. All we have to do now is stand our ground where Jesus has already given us the blessings and the promises. <clears throat> Help us to be good soldiers of the cross, standing up, standing up for Jesus, that people might be drawn to him as the powerful Savior. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now please remain standing. <clears throat>